hosting a chat with and about Lord Howe Island. It's one part of Australia that I've uh, yet to visit and I've been over most of the mainland anyway and uh, Tasmania but haven't got myself out to Lord Howe Island so it's fantastic to uh, have our presenters with us um, tonight to talk about it. Just quick housekeeping uh, for those who haven't joined us before uh, you're muted except for our panelists of course but we would love to hear from you so we have a Q&A box at the bottom of the screen. Uh, you can type in questions there or in, in the chat box and uh, Simon and I'll monitor those. If we don't manage to get out to all the questions um, during this uh, webinar, we'll certainly get back to you afterwards. Um, so let's get into it because we've got, uh, here comes Ian Hutton as well. We've got lots of people joining us and uh, we've got a half an hour session to, to chat away. And so uh, first to introduce uh, Jack Schick, who's a born and bred on Lord Howe Island. And Jack uh, leads tours and, and uh, guides people who are on the island. Then we also have uh, Shane uh, Moore from Eastern Air Services. Now, Eastern Air Services provide air access from the mainland across to Lord Howe Island. So welcome as well, Shane. And we have Peter. And um, Peter and his wife, Sh uh, Sharon, who's also born and bred um, Lord Howe Islander, own uh, Waymary, is that how I say it? Waymary Apartments on the island. Um, so yeah. it's accommodation. And we're also very privileged to have Ian Hutton signing in. Um, Ian, although not born on Lord Howe Island, has spent a large portion of his life there uh, and is very involved in a lot of the conservation efforts. And I think he and Jack might get up to a bit of mischief together, I'd imagine, on the island. Um, we also have uh, Simon from Wild Diaries joining us as well. Um, so let's start with uh, Jack. Could you just give us a bit of a brief introduction about yourself and what services you provide on the island for visitors? Okay, yeah, uh, like you said, I was uh, born and bred on Lord Howe. I'm a fifth generation Islander, and um, my wife and myself run uh, Sea to Summit expeditions. I um, do guided walks up to the top of Mount Gower, generally two times a week, and I also run a sightseeing, fishing, scenic type boat. I've been running the boat now for about 15 years or so. So um, yeah, we uh, got to got to sit back and enjoy the island at times as well. So <laughs> enjoy that as well. Exactly. So. Don't want to be working seven days a week. Crikey. Nah. <laughs> um, thank you very much for that. Now, Peter, if you brief introduction about uh, uh, your role on the island and the accommodation that you manage there. Yeah, I'm married to Sharon. She was born here, and she likewise is fifth generation. Lord Islander. Her parents um, built Wymery Apartments around 1980 and ran them till about four years ago when we purchased them and took over and did a big refurbishment. So I've been coming here for over 30 years and I've been living here for the last eight years pretty much full time in the next some way, doing some other work. Um, so we did a major refurbishment four years ago and we run Wymery Apartments. We have only four tourist bed licenses. So we have two apartments, two people in each one. And most people would probably be aware that the tourist beds here are strictly controlled and limited to 400. So we're a small business here. We have four out of 400 tourists staying with us. Um, we're proud of uh, what we offer to people. We have fantastic views and and privacy in a smaller venue. Fantastic, that's great. Now, Shane, you uh, provide a service that uh, connects people across to Lord Howe Island, but what? how did you get involved in Lord Howe Island? Is it somewhere you visited um, regularly or are you not a fifth generation Islander, I, I guess? <laughs> no, no, I'm not a, an Islander. Uh, myself and my partner is Christian Course. Christian was a aircraft maintenance organisation based here in Port Macquarie and he used to look after a couple of aircraft that were based at Lord Howe. Um, and I suppose about five years ago we started a discussion about services that we could see would be needed sometime in the future. Uh, and so we started setting up a service connecting Port Macquarie to Lord Howe. Um, that started off sort of smallish. Uh, we started off doing freight and passengers connecting up Port Macquarie uh, and Lord Howe and then uh, we've actually obtained a RPT licence with CASA, the Civil Aviation Authority, 
So we have the same sort of license as Qantas or Virgin or the, whoever, Virgin Rex and, and all the rest. Um, and we're in the process at the moment of diversifying to have not only Port Macquarie Lord Howe, but we're aiming for Newcastle to Lord Howe and then not long after that, Gold Coast to Lord Howe. Um, so we're in the paperwork uh, section at the moment with the uh, bureaucracy getting that approved, but that's mm -hmm. the plans within the next six to nine months. Fantastic. So there's going to be some great opportunities for people to get across to the island, which is amazing. Now, welcome, Ian. Thank you for joining us. If you'd just like to give us a little brief um, intro into yourself and how you ended up on Lord Howe Island and some of the work you do there. Uh, well, I went to Lord Howe Island in 1980 as the weatherman oh. and I was doing a two-year posting. I thought I'd be there for two years and then move on. And uh, here I am, 40 years later, still the uh, got to know the island, exploring it, studying the flora, the fauna, the marine life, and involved in a number of research projects. I've written about 10 books on the island and run a number of tours around the island, looking mm -hmm. at marine life, or birds, uh, plant walks, and I team up with Jack and we do a nice uh, pelagic seabird trip down to Ball's Pyramid together and uh, have been a little bit involved in conservation on the island as well with uh, running the Friends of Lord Howe Island Weeding Eco Tour Program and some other conservation issues. Fantastic. It certainly sounds like a place that uh, gets into people's blood, clearly, the, the uh, returning uh, res residents and the, the length of time that people have been involved in the island, which is fantastic. And to hear about the fifth generation family still there is, is awesome. Um, Jack, you mentioned you do, the image behind me is from the top of Mount Gower. Now that is one of the iconic things that uh, people can do when they're on the island. Um, might take a bit of energy, I'm sure. Give you a little bit of a description on how that all unfolds. Yeah, it's, um, it's not one for the faint hearted. It is certainly a, a tough, a tough climb. It's, uh, 785 meters or pretty much to the top. And, um, the thing about it is that you start from sea level, so you have to climb all of that and then mm -hmm. turn around and also walk back down, of course. Yep. So, yeah, it's um, it's a full day. We start early, around 7.30, and um, generally on top for lunch and then turn around and head back down. So, yeah, it's a big day, but um, it's very diverse. Rainforest, you walk through, and then mist forest on the top, so... It's a pretty special walk, that one. But um, you don't want to have any underlying health issues to um, attempt it because it, it, is, it is fairly challenging. Mm -hmm. And for yeah, those so that are, uh, aren't as fit and healthy, there are, must be some other great walks on the island that are a little less challenging. Oh, there's lots of walks. Yeah, there's lots of great walks on the island um, from beginner-type stuff, I guess you'd call it, to... Um, uh, yeah, just average type hikes to along the northern hills there, which is they're all around the 200 meter mark. So um, yeah, quite easy for people to access those uh, northern hills, Malabar, Longer Kings Lookout, etc. Yeah. Is it fairly yeah, easy to some... do the self guided walks, or do you, is it best to have a guide? Obviously, interpretation is much more valuable with a guide. Well, the only one you need really to do a guided walk with is the Mount Gower walk. All the rest, you can um, follow the tracks yourself. Um, but if you want to take someone like Ian Hutton or myself, you know, you can certainly learn a lot more by having a local uh, guide with you. Absolutely. That's great. Thank you very much. Now, back to Shane. I guess the, the flight across to the island, how long's that take? And uh, there must be certain times of year when there's some amazing marine wildlife that you'd see on the flight. Yeah, the... Um... It's nil wind, so because you the upper winds are directly west, so you normally have a quicker trip going out to the island and slightly slower coming back. Um, but the average time is about an hour and 20 minutes direct mm -hmm. through. Um, we travel through at about 27, 26,000 feet. So your, your sight coming down to marine life is a little bit limited, yep. um, except when <laughs> leaving the Port Macquarie area. At the moment, we've got a lot of whales going through, so it's a case of um spot the splash and <laughs> count the whales associated with it um but yeah it's about an hour and 20 minutes flight direct from port 
um, when we do uh, Newcastle uh -huh. and Phil and Gatta, uh, it's about an hour and 30 minutes nil win uh, from Newcastle and it's about an hour 40 out of Coolangatta. So they're relatively quick, uh, quick flights for the 300 or well, Port Macquarie to Lord Howe's just over 320 nautical miles. So it's a, a long way to put it um, on a land based. It's sort of Port Macquarie to Burke and a little bit more. Okay. So it's a fair distance uh, between, but yeah, travel it quite quickly. <clears throat> That's great, thank you. Um, Peter, the, your style of accommodation is self-contained. Um, so people yeah. have the capacity to um, look after themselves when they're there. What, what shopping outlets and restaurant mm. style things are available for people when they're on uh, Lord Howe Island? Yeah, there's, there's a number of uh, restaurants. Some are open uh, three meals a day, seven days a week. And the others uh, like the museum, golf club, bowling club, other places often just do two or three nights a week each to spread the load of of the work and the availability. Um, if people choose to eat out at night, it, everywhere, any lodge you stay at takes you out at night and the, the venue will take you home. So we don't want people riding around on push bikes and that late at night or things like that. But generally people get around on, on bikes here. Um, there are a couple of, there's a, a big general store on it, big for here, and there's other more specialty food things, only a couple. So there's plenty of scope to buy what you need to look after yourself here, if you wish, or you can eat out at night. It's, it's not difficult. Okay. Thank you very much for that. Ian, the island's very special for a lot of reasons, and some of it is because of the um, en endemic species, that uh, birds, and I'm not very good on that side of thing, but the birds and things that uh, inhabit the island, and um, I get, imagine some of them are migrationary. Um, and there's a few other large stick insects and things that are of great interest. Can you just give us a little bit of a detail on some of the wildlife and bird life and things that are, people can see there? Sure. Well, with a, a remote island, with some like ocean, it and mainland Australia, Certain groups of animals don't get there, so we don't have any mammal except the little insect eating bat. We don't have frogs or snakes, <clears throat> but we do have a lot of birds. In fact, seabirds, they choose to breed on remote oceanic islands, and Lord Howe Island does have more seabirds breeding than any other part of Australia. We've got 14 different species, uh, probably there's several hundred thousand individual birds breeding there each year. Most of the birds do breed spring to summer, so you could say September to March, but we have got three that breed through the winter, so many times of the year there is bird life there. And, of course, the land birds, we have um, the uh, famous endemic wood hen, a flightless bird that almost went into extinction in the 1970s. We are down about 20 individuals and a uh, big program to get rid of rat, uh, cats and pigs and control dogs, uh, made the island safe, so we have about 300 wood hens now. But the real uh, prolific animal life, the invertebrates, we have probably 4,000 invertebrate species, only about half have been formally described. But for example, 530 different beetle species, 130 different snail species. Lord Howe Island is the hotspot in Australia for snail evolution and diversity. And the Australian Museum have just published a little field guide to the snails of Lord Howe Island. Some people laugh and say, well, that, that may be the bestseller. But um, uh, a lot of people are interested in the snails and they're a very good indicator of the health of the biodiversity. If we have good snail populations, it means the island's going pretty well. Uh, and probably the most uh, well-known invertebrate is the phasmid, a big 10 centimetre long stick insect that uh, disappeared off Lord Howe Island because rats got onto the island in 1918 and ate that into extinction. But in 1964, some rock climbers on Ball's Pyramid found uh, a dead phasmid and that gave hope that the phasmid could be surviving down there. And about 2001, eventually scientists got onto the pyramid, uh, which is a rocky stack about 23 kilometres off Lord Howe Island. 
and uh, phasmids have been taken to Melbourne Zoo and there is a breeding program and uh, now that we have eradicated rats there was a big program in 2019 all the rats and mice have gone and one of the plans for the future the near future is to reintroduce that phasmid to the main Lord Howe Island and people ask well you know what did it do what's the point of having a phasmid there well there are no browsing mammals on Lord Howe Island that eat the leaves of the trees and resell them nutrients and the phasmid was one of the invertebrates that had that role so it's got an important role in the ecosystem of Lord Howe Island. Okay well Simon's just put a picture of one up fascinating. So that one's a male phasmid. The males have those really thick, chunky back legs. The yep. females have more slender legs. And at the Island Museum, there is uh, an enclosure. We have about uh, 15 phasmids there. So uh, visitors to the island go to the museum and see one. We're not putting them out in the uh, forest. Uh, Melbourne Zoo have a special population that, that are disease-free that they are going to release when the time's appropriate. But, yeah, visiting the museum, you can come and see and even hold a passport and get a photo taken with them, as uh, David Attenborough had done when he visited Melbourne Zoo a few years ago. Mm -hmm. We've got a few questions rolling in, so I might just throw one out. Uh, Jack, you might like to answer this one. What's the best time of year to visit Lord Howe Island? We've got a few people ask that question. Yeah, it's a it's a good one. That's a good question. Actually, it's um, I mean, we just had a glorious day today out here. It depends what you're really into. Um, if you want to be here more for the water snorkeling, swimming type activities or diving, there's all of that here. Um, definitely, probably spring through summer, but um. The winter, the winter season is a great time of year to do your land-based type activities, um, the hiking and stuff. It's not as not as hot. Not that the island does get very hot. A thirty-degree day here is super hot for Lord Howe. Mm -hmm. So um, yeah, the hiking stuff is probably better in the autumn and you know after <clears> the summer, yeah, after the summer's finished or even in winter. But um, it's gen generally the winter months are a little quieter than the, than the summer months. Our season generally starts, and Pete will back us up here, from September school holidays through to just after Easter is our, it was our general season, wouldn't you say, Peter? Yeah, definitely. Hmm. And another question we've asked a lot lately, but um, with the COVID situation, you're obviously closed to visitors at the moment. So when will the island reopen for so visitors can plan to come and visit? So from the from yeah. the 3rd of August, yeah. Okay. Except if you're in Victoria, open. probably. <laughs> well, Caroline, uh, somebody Victoria. also asked, um, uh, I think, Jack, you'd be the best to answer this, asked about uh, they, this... Um, lady has a, a trip booked for uh at the moment for april next year and wants to know how far in advance you would need to book you up for your mount gale walks april can be extremely busy particularly if it's um school if it coincides with school holidays so um yeah good to jump in early um jump on the website and send us an email the um, email is definitely at best um booking um, service, I think, for us out here. We, um, my wife's sitting on the computer now answering inquiries. <laughs> so, um, email is generally best. Yeah. But, um, yeah, a month, a month in advance is always good, I think. Okay. Thank you for that. Shane, a quick one for you. Um, a question about with increased uh, potential locations flying from mainland across to Lord Howe Island. What, can you just let people know what size planes you're flying and how often you're able to fly those? Because we've got a capacity question. Yeah. Okay. Um, we, when we did our research on for Lord Howe, um, Lord Howe is quite a short runway and therefore has operational requirements on it. So we searched for an aircraft that was still available today that could actually meet all the requirements of the Lord Howe Island restrictions. 
Um, and the only aircraft that's still in production today that meets those criteria that um, has no special dispensations issued is a um, Beechcraft King Air 200. Now, they're a smaller aircraft. It's the same aircraft that flying doctors uh, and air ambulance use. They're about um, nine seat aircraft. So with the fuel requirements for Lord Howe, we have eight seats to go out because we have to carry sufficient fuel that if there is for some reason unable to land on Lord Howe, we have to be able to return to the mainland. So there's eight uh, seats available on the way out and nine seats available on the way back. Um, and our business model is to run more frequent flights um, than just one or two a day. So, and we have, with the aircraft that we have, we have the ability to increase the number of flights to meet whatever demand becomes capable or wants it. Um, we're a smallish company with the idea of um, we can make decisions quite quickly and change things quite quickly uh, and put things in place by having a meeting of two people rather than getting a, a whole myriad of people to agree. So the, the, so the direct answer is the aircraft we use um, tra travels the same speed or faster slightly than Dash 8s, can travel higher than Dash 8s, can land on half the runway that's on Lord Howe, um, and uh, we can run as many flights as we need to to meet the demand. Uh, the business plan we actually have is that we could actually, if need be, we could actually run flights to increase the capacity to the island if it was needed by 50% compared to what it's capable of at the moment. Okay. And with the smaller planes, there's obviously going to be luggage restrictions, but have you got a sort of a, I know it's all a gross weight of passengers and luggage generally on those planes. Have you got a rough idea of the amount of luggage people will be able to, as a rule it's of about, thumb? It's about 14 to 15 kilos per person. Um, which, um, depending on how, how much gear you want to take, the need for what you need on Lord Howe, uh, you don't need a lot of gear. It's more relaxed and a, a very comfortable environment, uh, very little formalities. There's no point in bringing a tuxedo. Mm -hmm. I can't imagine Jack or Peter lining up for dinner in a tuxedo at any night. Um, so, yeah, it's the, the, the limit at the moment is 15 kilos. That's pretty standard on those smaller planes. So thank you for that. That was answered the, another question that came through. Um, it's great interaction with our audience tonight, which is wonderful. Uh, let me see. Uh, Peter, there's a lot of activities on the island, obviously, that people can do. Can they book them through your accommodation or once there, or is it best to pre-book before they get to the island? How does, how does that sort of system work? Yeah, we, we send people out. A month. There's a monthly sheet out every month that has when the tours are on and what's available, and we send that to our guests before they arrive. And all the booking is available on that. And if they need a hand, we can help them. We don't have a phone in the units. We have a phone in the transit room that guests can use to ring around the island and do bookings. Uh, so it's not at all difficult. And if there's any problem, they, we can organise it for them. But most people most things themselves. Okay, thank you for that. Uh, now, I've a little bit more about Jack here. Jack, beekeeping is a hobby of yours, I believe. On the Kangaroo Island, they have a special bee that's quite unique to the island. Is it, is it similar to Lord Howe or have you got the, the bee species that's you know present elsewhere? <clears throat> no, no, I just, I just run this... Um standard of team but um i have actually had some of those kangaroo island bees on lord Howe for a little while mm -hmm. yeah i i um they're they're not a bad bee but they can get a little bit savage i found sometimes <laughs> i'm not i'm not knocking the kangaroo island bee but uh, <laughs> i just run the standard the standard italian golden italian at the moment okay. um the honey's the honey's quite unique. It has a different flavour to the mainland because we don't uh, we don't really have eucalypts occurring here, so the uh, honey tastes a bit different to the mainland eucalypt style honey. Yeah. The islands is it a volcanic base? Is that what the and so the what sort of vegetation grows on it? Yeah, it's volcanic base. Um, 
and um, a lot of a lot of the plants here are endemic to the island. So you get uh, Ian Hutton's got books on the plants that people can purchase from the museum. So Ian's more the plant specialist than myself. Mm-hmm. Um, but uh, it's it's I don't know how you, how you how you would describe the uh, plant life. But uh, lots of palms, lots of uh, the endemic Kenyas. It's probably one of the things most people notice as soon as they get off the plane and start to move towards their accommodation, the uh, presence of so many palms, which is uh, quite unusual. There's four endemic palms here on Lord Air. So, um, but then when you get into the mountains, the forest is quite thick, quite thick forest mm-hmm. from sort of two metre forest up to 15 to 20 metre high. So quite diverse forest. Mm. Yeah. Okay, so we've got some questions um, around the island. Obviously, some fantastic marine life, and the southern is it the southernmost reef system in the in the world, basically in the southern hemisphere. Obviously, southern. Um, what's how does the snorkeling and diving compare to areas further north along the Great Barrier Reef? Has anyone got any experience on that? Um, I'll throw in a little bit if you like, Caroline. Thanks, Peter. Ian. So, um, Lord Howland does have the world's most southerly coral reef, and the red reef is mainly tropical. It's now um, 35 degrees south latitude. The East Australian current flows down across the Great Barrier Reef and it brings the eggs and larvae and, and species from those tropical regions. So, uh, terrific snorkeling. We, we have a lagoon where boats take people out to some snorkeling venues. And there are a couple of spots around the island, particularly in Ed's Beach, where you can just walk 10 or 20 metres off the beach and uh, you've got the coral reef and all the fish and other marine creatures, green turtles. They don't nest on the island, but they're around all year. So great opportunities just to snorkel off the beach or there are a number of tour operators providing the um, the uh, other trips outside uh, or just inside the reef. And there's a very professional dive operator there, uh, ProDive. They run a very good service and they have uh, many sites all around the island and even off Balls Pyramid where they take um, licensed scuba divers. Great. Thank you for that. We're, we're getting near the end of our time, but I've still got so many questions here about uh, things to see and do because it's, it's such an interesting place. But I um, another, uh, Peter, what's some of the activities you would recommend people do? I know there's quite a few... Um, adventure activities like kiteboarding and windsurfing and those sort of activities. Have you got some other suggestions of different things that can available for Peter, people? Most people fill their time in very easily here. You know, in, the, in the warmer months, the snorkeling and diving is, is really fantastic compared to most, most of the rest of the coral areas now in Australia, I believe. The, walk, the walks are fantastic. Uh, we get quite a lot of keen... Bird watchers come here at different times of the year for things. Um, if you just want to sit on the beach and read a book or whatever, it's very easy. It's it's not crowded here um, any time, really. There's enough space that you feel very relaxed and easy going. Um, so, yeah, look. Most, some people say, oh, I want to come over there for four days. And I say, well, you know, you really need longer <laughs> to fit, you know. It takes a bit of effort to get here. Um, the weather's not always perfect seven days a week. Um, but there's no way you could be, you know, not find something to do on each day. So we, we don't usually advise people what to do unless they really want help, but most of them have a good idea before they come what they're doing. May may I ask a question of Ian? Uh, By the way, Ian, I've just found a copy of your book here. (laughs) Ah, very good. (laughs) The shelf next to me. Um, Any of your books or any guides on the island uh, that show uh, walking tracks? So someone, uh, Peter, has just asked a little question about walking, which we part covered earlier, but if visitors visit, can they pick up a, a pamphlet and, and sort of freely walk themselves with a, a local, you know, local literature? Sure, the Lord Howland Board have a number of brochures for tourists, and one of them is a uh, detailed walking map, shows the distances, gives a grading system. 
So that's a free file to have that. Um, and then I have a little book, The Rail, it's kind of Lord Howe Island, so it gives you more detail on each walk about what plants you might see, what birds, a uh, little bit of history snippets along the way. So you can pick up a uh, rambler's guide at the museum or one of the other shops uh, if you want to do a bit more detail about what you see when you're out on, on, on the tracks on your own. And, and Ian, you do, a, you do I think three talks a week as standard at the museum, don't you? So that would be an opportunity for people to meet you and actually get a, a, a first impression of the island almost as soon as they arrived. Sure, actually four uh, lectures a week at the museum. They're all 5.30 p.m. to 6.30 p.m. Different topics, so uh, Sunday's uh, introduction to geology and climate change impact of what how. Uh, then we have Monday, the birds, Thursday, the history, and Friday, the marine life. So open to the public and uh, just a small fee to help run the museum with those lectures. So. After the lecture, I, I hang around. If anybody wants a bit of more, more detail, talk about anything, yeah. Sounds perfect. There's a good reason to stay for the week, so you can include all of Ian's talks in your weekly stay. So it sounds fantastic. Okay, we'll just do a quick whiff around um, for one last comment from everyone. So, Shane, uh, why should people go to Lord Howe Island? What's your opinion on it all? Um, Probably the best comment I can give is uh, we had a, a passenger that travelled out there from the local area around the Port Macquarie with us uh, probably about mm, six, nine months ago. Uh, and he travelled to a lot of other places and his wife had organised it for trying to give him a, a break and a week away from work and all the rest of it. And when he was going, he was saying, oh, you know, we normally go Fiji, uh, Hawaii, all the rest of it. And when he came back, all he could do was sprout about how it was a little bit of paradise that was so close that he didn't even know about. Uh, and since then, he's been back three times since. Um, so I think what it is is the fact, um, I mean, it's always, uh, I love it when I go across every time I go across because it's just such a relaxed, enjoyable, pleasant. The temperature is always nice because it's surrounded by a warm current of water. The, the winter temperature doesn't drop much below 14, 15 degrees at night, and that'd be a rare night. You know, it stays pretty warm through the evenings. Um, it's just a breath of fresh air. Fantastic, thank you. Peter, you mentioned the island has a cap of 400 visitors, and I think that's wonderful. We're going through a time of great change around the tourism industry at the moment around the world, and the the much used word of over tourism. I think it's, is that a conscious decision by the Lord uh, Howe Island Tourism or the, the to cap the numbers? Oh, it, it was, uh, Lord Howe was the first World Heritage area in Australia, I believe. And I think it had been well looked after by people here for generations. They were very aware of, of what they were doing and how special the place was. Um, but it's been a cap of 400 since early 1980s or perhaps earlier. And, yeah, look, it's, it's, that's been fantastic because it's stopped overdevelopment. You can have a relaxing, quiet holiday here. Self-distancing is very easy <laughs> on North Island. Um, so, and the proximity to the mainland, it's an easy flight. You know, the climate's very gentle and kind and scenically it's beautiful so it's got an awful lot to recommend it um, and I'm extremely lucky to be living here. Thank you very much and it sounds amazing. Jack across to you um, as you soar above the island in your hang glider what other great um, aerial options and land-based options are there for guests on the island with a bit of adventurous streak? Well, there's, um, if someone does know how to fly a hang glider and they have all their particular ratings, I'd be more than happy for them to fly my glider if they're uh, if the wind's happening in the right, you know, particular direction. It's very um, weather dependent, things like that. But um, we often get kite surfers in winter months, um, and kite surfing gear is reasonably light so you can easily 
uh, fit that onto a plane. It might go a little. You might go a little bit over your 15 kilo weight, but it's um, pr pretty pretty compact sort of gear. Um, you got that full lagoon, like you can see in the picture behind you there. So you can um, kite surf through there. That's a great fun, great fun thing to do. And um, but as far as other flying, there's not really that much flying. There used to be scenic flights here, but um, I think Eastern might operate a scenic flight every now and again. But um, it is certainly a beautiful spot to view from the air. But um, if you can't do it by air, you can certainly climb up a high peak and have a look, have a bird's eye view. Yep. Yeah. Fantastic. Just on that point, Caroline, um, yep. one of the things that we have been trying and we've got the approval from Marine Parks Australia is that um, each week when we take um, items out for the island, there's one aircraft that we can convert in for scenic flights to go up to Middleton and Elizabeth Reef which is another 200 nautical, almost 200 miles further north. Um, now, there's nowhere to land on it, but it's a quite amazing um, lagoon um, reef system. Um, and so we do that, but it's always, unfortunately, it's very weather dependent. Uh, and you've got weather dependent in two places to worry about. Up, actually up at Middleton and Elizabeth Reef and also back on the island. Mm -hmm. But it's something that we do offer uh, through the summer months in particular on a weekly basis on a Friday. Okay, great. Thanks for that. Now, Ian, we'll leave the last comment to you. Obviously, it's being a World Heritage listed site and it's a very unique place. Have you got any more sort of um, hints to us on some of the absolute unique things that people can uh, experience when they're there? Well, I think the great thing about Lorto Island as a holiday uh, destination is it's a one-stop shop for all of the nature. You have the beautiful uh, lagoon and the tropical marine life. You have the seabird colonies, you have rainforest and the low hills, then you have the adventure of the, the mountain climbs and different sort of rainforests there. So if you fly to the island, you can bicycle around. There's no driving from one place to another to seek out another activities. You cycle or walk and you have that great variety of the marine life, the birds, the rainforest, and uh, in, in that great setting with just 400 tourists so often you can go down to a beach any time of the year and no footprints on the beach there are that many beaches uh, to spread around so yeah i think to me that's a great uh, thing about lord harm and that one stop shop fantastic well in closing i'd like to thank all of you it's been a wonderful um mm -hmm. evening this evening uh, learning a lot more about lord howe island certainly whetted my appetite even more to get myself over there so thank you for joining us. Thank you to our audience. And uh, hopefully we will be sending people your way to experience this beautiful place very soon. Thank you, everybody. Stay safe. <laughs>